collectivization of the early 30s of the last century was rapid. The main task is to unite all peasants without exception into collective farms, the so-called collective farms. And not only people, but also livestock, cows, horses, agricultural machinery, etc., regardless of anyone or anything. All this was done almost in an orderly manner. For refusing to enter the collective farm, all the so-called Culex, part of the middle peasants, were deprived of everything, evicted from their own homes and exiled to Nurim. The old believers gathered and discussed for a long time the grief that had befallen everyone. A wide variety of options were offered. Some advised to go further into the Taiga, others insisted to leave through the ridges to Tanutuva, since the border was almost closed, and some insisted to stay in place and wait for what would happen. Later it was said that delegates came, gathered people and talked a lot about the benefits of collectivization. One old man, telling me about the time set. They tempted with satanic speeches, after their speeches the men began to scatter through the Taiga, but they lived freely, did not interfere with anyone, there was a settlement in every log. Opinions were divided, and they began to make decisions, each according to his own understanding. Some managed having crossed the mountain ranges, to go to Tuva, others tried to move closer to the workers' settlements, where there was government work, but the main part remained in place, and an agricultural atoll was subsequently organized in the village of Tishi. And the Lykovs and their relatives moved to the upper reaches of the Abokan, and on its right bank, at the confluence of the Kairasu River, they settled down. Five walled huts were cut down here in a short time, and this village received the official name of the Verkhnyaya Kurjik Zemka, in any case, this is how it is indicated in the documents. In total, six families moved here, of which three are the families of the Likov brothers, Stepan, Karp and Evdikim. There was nowhere else to go. So they settled in this remote Tega place, naively thinking that they would not be reached so easily, and they could survive here a dashing time. However, they did not lose touch with the world. They closely followed everything that happened in the state. And now one should not judge the correctness of their decisions. In those years when it was so simple, suddenly, so to speak, without preparation, the authorities decided to dispose of the fate of the bulk of the inhabitants of Russia, many were confused. In those years, scientific expeditions began to appear in the Altai and Cyan Mountains, which were engaged in the study of this territory, which is of great scientific interest. And there were plenty of white spots in the nature of Siberia. To work on expeditions, guides and workers were invited from local residents from among the hunters and taiga. All these people were experts in flora and fauna, medicinal plants. And they knew the area like the back of their hand. Young men eagerly accepted invitations to work on expeditions and provided invaluable assistance in collecting various scientific material, creating a camp life, caring for horses and preserving expeditionary property. Timely warned about the approach of any life-threatening natural phenomena according to only they know the signs. And often they unwittingly became assistants to the chiefs of expeditions. Their knowledge of nature gave them unquestionable authority and we must give them their due, they helped in the study and study of the nature of the Altai Cyan mountain taiga system. In the reports and works of researchers who traveled in the Altai and Cyan mountains, you can find dozens of names of local residents who took part in expeditions, to which the scientists refer. These are residents of the northeastern Altai and western Cyan, in particular the lower, Tisha and upper Kurjuk settlements. Their close relatives still live in the villages of Altai and Cyan. The surnames of Molokov, Demenov, Shmarin, Zolotayev, Bersand, Samolov, Perev and others appear especially often. And, of course, the Lykovs, whose surname was put on military topographic maps in the early 40s. In the 20s of the last century, the All-Russian Society for Nature Conservation carried out a great deal of work on nature conservation, where Schillinger, a man who roamed Russia up and down, was the chief specialist and great connoisseur of wildlife. The result of his numerous scientific expeditions was the creation of projects for over 20 reserves in the Usar, including the Altai one. Traveling through Altai and Western Cyan, Schillinger determined the approximate boundaries of the future reserve and, upon returning from the expedition, presented for consideration his project, centered on Lake Telexi. The protected area included the most scientifically interesting places and rare natural landscapes. 
The creation of the reserve on Lake Telexi was the most important event of the time. The reserve encompassed a significant part of the Lake Telexi Basin, its right bank, the right bank of the Chulishman River and the upper reaches of the Bolshoi Abakan River and became one of the largest reserves in the Asa, thus, the Verkhnyaya Kurjuk hut of the Lykovs ended up on the territory of the Altai Nature Reserve. The reserve was organized by the decree of the All Russian Central Executive Committee and the Council of People's Commissars of the Rusfers on May 4, 1930. Local authorities, the Arot and Kakas Regional Executive Committees in December 1931, by a special resolution, recognized the opening of the reserve as expedient. In April 1932, a decree on the establishment of the State Altai Reserve within the Arot and Kakas regions appeared. Although the text of the resolution referred to the territory about 1 million hectares, in fact, its area was more than 1.3 million hectares. The main base for the management of the reserve was the village of Yelu. As soon as the rumor about the creation of the reserve got around, and people found out what kind of organization it was, residents of the nearby districts reached out to the reserve in order to enter such an interesting public service. Among them were the indigenous inhabitants, Altai and Old Believers. Tega people, hunters, pathfinders, experts in Gorni Altai and Western Sion were taken into the protection of the reserve by observers. Carpenters, joiners and peasants who know agriculture were invited to organize a subsidiary farm, build a village in cordons. The overwhelming majority of the hired observers in the guard were decent, modest and at the same time decisive and courageous people. They all knew the Tega well, the conditions in which they would have to work, and quickly figured out the objectives of the reserve and their responsibilities. From their midst somehow immediately stood out, Molokov Danila Makarovich, whom I often mention in this story is a kind, attentive, disciplined person. In the collective of the reserve, he enjoyed authority throughout the years of service in the protection. Molokov knew the look of family and many old believers living in the western sign very well. The situation developed in such a way that almost all contacts with the Lykovs fell to his lot. Demina Valerian Fedosevich was a match for Molokov, and the character and knowledge of the wild nature. An unsurpassed hunter trap, a great connoisseur of medicinal plants. Observers deserve attention, Kulbakin, Tobakov, Polovin, Budov, Yakovlev, and Dadikov, Forrester Abramov and others. All of them have done a lot to equip this vast reserve. In the total Massachusetts of people who entered various construction and maintenance work, there were relatives of the Lykovs and residents of most of the Abokan settlements. Ushapkov Moisey Asipovich, his relative Ivan Sergeyevich Brilyakov and Parfenty Filimonovich Kazanin stood out especially clearly. These conscientious and deeply knowledgeable people have been engaged in large-scale farming of the reserve for many years, until its liquidation in 1951. Kazanin is the father of seven children, was a close relative of Likov. The Ashapkovs, although far away, were also related to the Lykovs. Stepping back a little, I would like to say more about these people. Firstly, they all had contact with all the worldly ones, just like most of the inhabitants of Siberian villages had contact with each other, and we didn't feel any particular edge. But they stood out for their personal household management, hard work, cleanliness. The first of the Ashapkov family to come to Siberia, during the reign of Alexander I, was Fro Ashapkov with his family. They came from Perm and first settled near the city of Tomsk in the village of Borovushka. But they stayed here for a short time and soon moved to Altai, where they finally settled in the village of Ashpanik. The Fro family had seven children. One of his sons, Osip, was born in Altai. He also had seven children. His children were distinguished by their great growth, physical strength and a clear mind. Moses and Akinfi stood out especially. Akin Fyosipovich did not live long. He died before the war in the village of Yelu as a result of a medical error at the age of 29, leaving seven children in his wife's arms. His eldest son Luca graduated from the seven-year school and, by self-education, comprehended working with metal, comprehended electric, turning, and auto business. His entire estate is a solid workshop. Forge, winches, metal and wood processing machines. He approached all works creatively. 
He designed and built a mini tractor, invented and installed automation on a lathe, invented an electric splitter to chop wood. All homework is done by units built by him. Luca is the father of seven children. Now he lives in Altai in the village of Udaloka. Mosi Asipovich had no children. He was an attentive, sympathetic person. He was always one of the first to appear where something happened and, as best he could, provided help, if needed, to anyone who needed it. For many years he was in charge of the reserves economy, and any work related to sowing, harvesting, haymaking and other matters was done in due time. He was tall, powerful in build and possessed great physical strength. His strength amazed everyone. There are many cases where he used his power to the great amazement of those present. I recall a funny incident that I witnessed. Once before the war we played on the shore of the lake, near the pier. The main warehouse of the reserve was also here. The warehouse was open, and we saw how one carpenter from the construction team, a rather large man of solid build, brought out of the warehouse, one by one, two large boxes of nails, put them one on top of the other on a block and waited for the cart to take the nails to their place. Construction. At this time Moisey Osipovich passed by. The carpenter, seeing him, smiling and joking, said, Pashukov, take the nails away. Moisey Osipovich did not say anything, silently walked over, picked up both boxes more comfortably under the arm of his right hand, then turned rather sharply to the carpenter, bent down slightly, grabbed his legs in the knee area with his left hand, and straightening up, threw the carpenter with his stomach on his left shoulder and also silently and unhurriedly carried both the carpenter and the nails. It was 200 meters to the construction site. We rushed after them. Moisey Osipovich easily carried his burden to the construction site and, amid the laughter of the whole brigade, carefully put the carpenter on his feet, threw the boxes on the ground and, without saying a word, went about his business. Everyone was amazed and began to loudly estimate the total weight. It turned out in the range of 170, 180 kilograms. At the beginning of the war, Oshikov went to the front. Throughout the war years, Brilyakov and Kazanin were engaged in agricultural work. Both of them knew the peasant business perfectly, therefore there were no failures. Demobilized in 1945, Oshikov headed this work, and in the first post-war years, only wheat was harvested up to centners per hectare. This is an outstanding result, and the director of the reserve Martinov twice directed the submission to confer the title of Hero of Socialist Labor on Oshikov. Unfortunately, both views went unanswered. But let's get back to the beginning of the reserve's activities. The hired observers immediately began to arrange, first of all, the boundaries of the reserve. For this purpose, on all paths and roads, shields were installed with a detailed statement of the rules of conservation. A lot of explanatory work was carried out with residents of nearby villages and villages about what a reserve is and about its benefits in preserving and enriching nature. During the next detour of the border of the reserve, the head of the guard with the observers visited the upper Kyrgyz Zemka and informed all residents that they are now on the territory of the state reserve, where any exploitation of nature is prohibited. They were introduced to the rules of conduct on the territory in detail and warned about the strict implementation of these rules. However, at the request of the residents, given the special situation, they were allowed to fish, collect pine nuts, mow the grass, in a word, what is necessary within the limits of personal need. The inhabitants of the Zemka were sympathetic to what they had to perform. Once on the territory of the reserve, they decided for some time how they should now be. On the one hand, they were limited by all sorts of prohibitions, which did not quite suit them, on the other hand, here they were, as it were, under the protection of the law. After consulting, it was decided to stay here for a while and wait for what would happen. All three brothers insisted on this, Stepan, Karp and Evdikim. Moreover, the head of the guard said that people would be needed here for protection and for the construction of a cordon at the mouth of the Kony River. The management of the reserve would not mind not touching this settlement, but at the time in the midst of collectivization, all residents of separate settlements, on the basis of a special decree, were asked to unite into settlements, at least ten households. There were also six courtyards, so the village was subject to liquidation. But, given that the settlement is located in the depths of the reserve and the inhabitants could be hired, they were left alone for a while. The question of the future fate of the village remained open. 
but fate made its own adjustments ahead of thinking about what decision to make. In 1933, a terrible tragedy happened in the village on Karasu. At the beginning of summer, a common acquaintance of the inhabitants of the old believer Nikifer Yaroslavtsev came from the Lebad River. He felt a little nimble, complained of a headache, stopped for a few days to rest and wanted to move on. He made his way abroad to Tuva in order to find a place to live and then take his family there, as he did not want, like most old believers, to enter the collective farm. Every co-religionist who showed up and, naturally, brought a lot of news, was welcomed here, so he was welcomed. After resting, Nikifer left the village and went to Tuva. Soon after he left, several people in the village fell ill at the same time. The disease immediately alarmed everyone, since no one had encountered such a disease. It proceeded rapidly. All patients complained of severe headache, showing pain. It was difficult to get up, walk, there was frequent vomiting. The sick from time to time lost consciousness, raved, and, as eyewitnesses said, they climbed the wall from pain in the head, talked at random, lost their memory and died in agony. The first to die was Grandfather Nazari, followed by matchmaker Galakshin Sanakin, father of Karpasipovich, Osipofimovich, elder brother Stepan. Karpasipovich, Lupin, Isai Nazarovich fell ill. The village froze, fell silent. Whatever they did, nothing helped. They did not have time to bury. It became scary. Fear gripped everyone. No one doubted that Nisiphorus brought this disease, so everyone gathered and decided to go to someone on the swan and carry the disease back from where it was brought. This mission was entrusted to carry out the light on foot of the Kimlikov, who held on more tightly than anyone else. Before the next morning, a prayer service was served, and Evdikim went to the swan before sunrise, taking the disease with him. He had to go over 150 kilometers of dense mountain taiga, crossing the Abokan Ridge. Now it is difficult to say exactly what kind of disease it was, but judging by the symptoms and the way the disease proceeded, we can almost say with confidence that it was a form of meningitis. A terrible disease, especially since there was no medical assistance. Evdikim safely reached the Swan River and near the place where Nikifer lived, left the disease. But the most important thing is that on the day when Evdikim took away the disease and when the sun rose, the seriously ill Karpasipovich, Lupin, Isai Nazarovich felt a little better and recovered soon after. The disease receded. Nobody else died. In total, the disease claimed five people. In the 40s, I asked the former residents of those places, how was this done, how did he take the disease? One of the old believers said, answering my naive question. The Lord helped, we did everything right, as it should be, and after a pause, he added, in his thoughts he carried it. This is all that we managed to find out, but it could not be otherwise. Details of such treatments are not publicized. Interestingly, the disease hardly touched either children or women. Many years later, when I met Agafya Lykova, I asked her what she knew about the tragedy, and she confirmed to me almost everything that I already knew. And when asked what the further fate of Nisiphorus was, she said, Nikifor died in Tuva. She knew all this from the stories of her parents. Later I learned that Nikifor had safely crossed the border into Tuva, found a place to live, returned, took his family and, once again crossing the border with his family, cut down the house and suddenly died. Unfortunately, no one at the time paid any attention to this tragedy. They just stated a fact. They died and that's it. The old believers themselves said. All the will of God. In a word, no help to the victims. And so it all went into oblivion. The Massachusetts of organizational issues in the management of the reserve did not allow in the first years to keep under control the vast territory of the reserve all the time. Of the means of transportation and communication, only riding horses, and the distances are hundreds of kilometers of taiga, mountains, passes, swamps, etc. The question of how to deal with the village on Abokan has been returned more than once. We consulted with the commander-in-chief and local authorities. But the time was special, collectivization was coming to an end, private property ceased, the so-called individual farms were crumbling with might and main, and in the village on Abokan there was no arthal, no collective farm, nothing. The proposal to leave the village as it is was rejected. Leaving it on the territory means officially committing a violation, 
which would significantly contradict the state law on the liquidation of private property. Therefore, it was decided to offer the inhabitants of the settlement to find another place to live and leave the reserve. In the fall of 1933, the observers of the reserve, Danila Molokov, Nikolai Budud, Alexei Kobakin, Forrester Semyon Abramov, headed by the head of the security, appeared at the hunt and, having gathered all the residents, explained to them that the high authorities did not allow them to leave them on the territory of the reserve, so they had to leave from the territory. The old believers silently listened to this verdict, realizing that no one would take any objections or complaints into account. They agreed with everything that was said and once again began to collect their simple belongings. It's a common thing. Well, getting out of here was much easier than getting here. Downstream, and there it will be seen, and we were almost ready for such a turn of affairs. The main thing is to move to where there is government work, just not to a collective farm. In the early spring of 1934, the inhabitants of Zemka began to leave this fateful place. Some of them floated down the river to their abandoned houses several years ago, and the family of Karpasipovich, which by the time consisted of three people, went to Elthai on the Swan River. Later, the inhabitants of those places said that Akulina Karponna, who wanted to be closer to her native places, took her family to Labat. Their first son was in his fifth year, but he was already quite firmly on the riding horse. Karpasipovich chose a place to live in the town of Novikov, which is slightly higher than the confluence of the mountain river Kurchik into the Lebad River. And a little higher there were two courtyards, in one of which lived the Tropin's family, the future relatives of the Lykovs. Evdikim helped Karp's family move to Lebad, and he, in turn, promised to return in the fall and help his brother clean up the garden and move the family. In the meantime, one family of Evdikim remained at the hunt, who also planned to leave this place in the fall after harvesting and go down the river, which was officially reported to the management of the reserve. Evdikim's wife Axinia was expecting a child, and this was the main reason for the delay, and their first young son was seriously addicted. Personally, Evdikim did not want to leave these places. He thought to stay and join the protection of the reserve at the Cordon, which was to be built on the border of the reserve at the confluence of the Kony River into Abakan. He talked about this with the head of security who, in principle, did not object, especially since Molokov spoke positively about Evdikim and recommended that he be hired. This question has practically been resolved. But in any case, it was necessary to leave from the capture to Kaira. So the question of resettlement would have been resolved peacefully, but fate again brought its terrible adjustments to their lives. As it turned out later, other residents of the Abakan settlements, and not only them, thought about entering the protection of the reserve at the Abakan cordon, in a word, there were many applicants. But Evdikim was, so to speak, the number one candidate. This circumstance was the reason that the management of the reserve received an anonymous letter in which the characteristic of Evdikim Likov was stated. The letter was transmitted through hunters and observers. This dirty, slanderous letter said that Evdikim was poaching, he was not going to leave the territory of the reserve, and if he was accepted into the guard, he would open the gates to his people for fishing on the territory of the reserve. They even agreed to the most incredible, as if Evdikim provided assistance to the bandits who took refuge in the Tega after the end of the civil war in Kakosia. By the way, Evdikim was 15 years old when the civil war in Siberia ended. Now it is difficult to say who was the author of this dirty letter, and it is impossible. Sindon Zolotayev on others, but all this in Philistine gossip. The management of the reserve immediately sent two observers to Abokin, Nikolai Rusikov and Dutray Klistyanov in order to understand and find out the situation. I must say that the management acted rashly in this matter, did not consult with people who knew the Likov brothers well, did not take into account the fact that Nikolai Rusikov, always in a belligerent mood, was unrestrained, made decisions, obeying hot temper, fervor, without thinking about the fact that how it can all end. To resolve such serious issues, it was necessary to send the chief of security with those who knew the Lykovs well and the situation in the settlements on the Abakan River. Such people, of course, were reasonable, calm observers, Molokov, Demenov, Budov, Kulbakin, the young forester Abramov. In a word, there was no shortage of decent, experienced people, the head of security at the time was on a business trip in the regional center. It is clear that such a hasty decision was clearly rushed. The observers appeared at the hut unexpectedly for the Lykovs, 
who at the time were finishing digging potatoes and immediately did not pay attention to two people who came out of the tega with rifles in their hands. Evdekim was the first to notice the people walking towards them and quietly told Karp about this. The brothers stopped digging and carefully examined the two armed men walking slowly towards them. The Lykovs did not even think that they were the observers of the reserve, and they were at a loss. First of all, an incomprehensible and eerie form of clothing worried. They did not know that shortly before this the observers had received a special uniform. They wore black riding breeches, black tunics with bright yellow emblems on green buttonholes of turned down collars, and black pointed helmets with small peaks on their heads. What kind of people, where did they come from, for what purpose they came, could not understand. Evdekim was the first to break down, shouting something, and rushed to his hut. Karp rushed after him. The observers did not even try to clarify the situation, did not tell them who they were, for what purpose they came. They did not even try to stop, introduce themselves and try to calm them down, and only then, as they say, discuss everything at a round table. No, this did not happen, on the contrary, Rusikov, seeing the brothers running, shouted sharply. Stop, stop, I will shoot. And raised his rifle. Karpa Sipovich stopped, but Evdokim continued to run. There was very little left to the saving hut, when a shot thundered, which, if to speak in essence, had to be fired upwards. But Rusikov shot, as it would sound now, to kill, shot in the back. Evdokim stumbled, began to fall and, restraining himself with his hands, pushed into the ground, but almost instantly jumped up and, without running into the hut, disappeared into the taiga. The bullet hit the left side, pierced the intestines, stomach and exited in the right side of the abdomen just above the navel. The wound is fatal. After running a little more, Evdokim hid in a cache. Aksinya, who saw everything, ran after him. I must say that the young observer Klistyanov, seeing that Rusikov raised his rifle, shouted. Don't shoot, they don't seem to understand who we are. But Rusikov did not heed the voice of reason. Two or three hours later, Evdokim died in agony in the arms of his pregnant wife. This is how this essentially scary clarification of the circumstances associated with the dirty anonymous letter ended, which Evdokim never found out about. The observers drew up a protocol in which they accused the Lykovs of allegedly resisting, thereby threatening their lives, and left the settlement on the same day. Karpasipovich categorically refused to sign what he said was a false paper. Karpasipovich and Aksinya remained together near the killed Evdokim, surrounded by Tega and the hopeless grief that had fallen on them. Late in the evening, they carried Evdokim's body to the hut, laid it in a hastily hollowed out domina, and the next day buried close relatives next to those who had recently died from an unknown illness. After the funeral, Karpa Sipovich floated Evdokim's family down the Abakan, and he himself went to his family on the Lebad River. Here the next year their daughter Natalia was born. She is the only one from the Likov family who was born in Altai in the Turochek region of the Iraq Autonomous Region, now the Altai Republic. So this unfortunate village, lost in the dense taiga, ceased to exist. It turned out that they came here in order to untimely bury those clothes to their hearts here and then leave their expensive graves in an alarming unknown. Upon their return, the observers presented the director with a drawn-up protocol and a detailed explanatory note, in which, significantly distorting the actual events, they accused the Lykovs of armed resistance. This incident stirred up the entire village. Many workers of the reserve, who knew the Lykovs well, were at a loss. How could Evdokim, who sincerely wished to work in the reserve, when the question of his admission was practically resolved, provide armed resistance? In a word, they did not quite believe this, but, talking among themselves, they said that something was wrong here. The incident was reported to the area. An investigation was carried out, but somehow superficially, as if not attaching special importance. No one was brought before the court. Mid-thirties. The most confused in the early time. Well, killed, and what's so special? So it is to blame. In the spring of 1935, a group of observers led by the head of the security visited an abandoned village. Examining the surroundings of the village, they found that the bear had dug up Evdokim's grave, pulled out the corpse and ate it. The deck in which Evdokim was buried was lying nearby. No bones, remnants of clothing, and a half-preserved skull were everywhere. 
the observers dug the grave again, laid dry grass in the domina, laid everything that was left of Evdokim, and buried it again. Molokov, years later, told us that everything he saw then made a depressing impression on everyone. Cases of bears digging up corpses in rural cemeteries in Siberia are known, although they were extremely rare even in such remote places. The thing is that the shallowly buried bodies attracted the bears with the smell of decomposition, and in this case it was difficult for Akar Pasipovich alone to dig a deep grave and even more difficult to lower the heavy log, so they buried Evdokim as best they could, to a shallow depth. In a conversation with Agafya Lykova, I asked her if she knew who had written the denunciation against Evdokim, or maybe she had heard anything about the case. To my surprise, she said with confidence. Yermeli Zolotay have proved on Evdokim. And to my question, how does she know this, she replied, Titenka said. By the way, Molokov was of the same opinion. The Lykovs lived in the Turochek region for almost three years. During this time, Akulina Karpana managed to visit her native village Debovo, where she was born and where their relatives still lived. At the beginning of 1937, the Lykovs were unexpectedly visited by the Enkv officers and asked in detail how and under what circumstances Evdokim was killed. And although something threatening was not felt in the conversation, on the contrary, the employees sympathized with Likov, said that the observers were wrong and that it was necessary to sort out this story. However, Karpasipovich was alarmed in earnest. He began to think that this case would not end so easily, that observers could say anything, justifying their actions, and accuse him of something that had not happened. In that alarming atmosphere, when all people lived, not quite understanding what was happening in the country, when people began to fear each other, Karpasipovich decides to leave for the Tega. And to leave so that no one knows where they left, where they stayed. And I must say that he succeeded brilliantly. Lukov took his family back to their native places in the upper reaches of the Bolshoi Balkan, where he knew literally every meter of the area. Now, many years later, it should be noted that by the time Lukov made the right decision, to go where they could least be expected. Exactly to where they were evicted several years ago. Later, when meeting with Molokov, he will say, Then we would have left in peace, and they began to expel us from the dashing, now I will not leave at all from here. So they again found themselves on the territory of the reserve and settled on a small terrace on the right slope of the Abokan River Valley. Please share this video on your social networks, using the buttons under the video and subscribe to the channel. I ask you to go and watch other videos about Agafya Lykova, which you can see now on the screen in the end screen savers. There are a lot of rare and interesting facts about the hermit. Thank you all for watching.